Hi, this is Bobby. The title of today's teaching is The Portrait of Satan, God of This World. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, if Satan came into your church, who would most people think he was? And the answer is that most people would truly think that he was God. The problem that we have is that our image of the devil is like the picture on the left. We think that he comes with flaming fire, that he's evil looking, that he's scary looking, that he has a terrible voice that scares us. And the reality is, yes, sometimes he does appear that way, but most of the time he's coming as God. And his main deception is that he comes across that he is God himself. And so what we're going to do in this teaching is we're going to get a complete portrait of Satan. We're going to look at him from his God perspective. And then what we'll do is we will have an idea of what to look for where anybody can see a devil coming as a devil. But what we need to look for is we need to identify a God who has messed up satanic qualities. Okay, Then we will have found the devil when he is in disguise. So here would be some more pictures that people would think of when they think of the devil. You know, I kind of like the picture on the left. Um, he's evil looking. He's a skull. He's a symbol of death. It's dark and ominous behind him. There's all these souls at his feet. You know, so this is one of my favorite visuals of thinking of the evil of Satan. You know, there are many other pictures you could use. Um, he's a an angel of death who comes in darkness. So maybe like this picture in the top middle. We know that one of the names of Satan is that he is a dragon. And, you know, he does actually have a creature, a beast called Leviathan who breathes fire. Okay, we have other images like you see in movies, like the, the horns on the head. Um, and so forth. Okay, so this is our common imagery of the devil. Okay, the reality is we need to begin looking for a different picture. Okay, so we're, we have a lot of reading to do. This is going to be a long lesson, so just bear with me. And if you're on YouTube, you can use the speed up feature to make it go faster. Okay, so number one, the objective of this teaching is to reveal to you a more accurate portrait of Satan. Most people's image of Satan is more like a demon or a dragon who was commissioned to do evil tasks. People think only in terms of an evil looking being whose primary objectives are to steal, kill, and destroy. The reality is that stealing, killing, and destroying are only secondary objectives of the devil. His number one objective is to be worshiped as God. Okay, so we need to keep in mind that somebody who wants to be worshiped as God is not gonna come to you looking like a devil. The majority of the world don't want a devil, as we think of devils today. They don't want a blatantly evil creature. Okay, They want a god. Okay, So Satan's number one disguise is he's going to come as God, present himself as God. If Satan walked into your average church, the majority would think he was God himself, or at least a beautiful angel of God. Satan is a glorious and beautiful angel. His heart may be like a dragon. But his appearance is beautiful, his speech is enticing, and he speaks of holiness and righteousness. He presents himself as God, yet he is a God who has some things wrong with him, which we need to learn to identify. Okay, so this is going to be the key thing. And what we're going to be looking for are attributes of this so-called God, which do not align with Jesus. Okay, Jesus is the measuring stick for everything. Jesus came to this earth for a few purposes. You know, one, he came to set us free from oppression of the devil. Two, he came to um, reveal the Father to us. Okay, and so we see by way of the things that he did, by way of the deeds that Jesus did, he was doing the works of the Father. And he was undoing the works of the devil. Okay, and in doing the deeds of the Father, we come to know who Father really is. And Jesus manifested the name of God to us. The name of God is Father. It's not any other name. Jesus gave us one name and then one nickname. He called him Father. He said we should worship Father. We should pray to Father. We should venerate as holy the name Father. We should baptize in the name Father. Okay, so it's all about the name Father. And then the nickname he used was Abba, which is like Daddy or Papa. Okay, so that's just an informal reference to, to Father. Okay, so our measuring stick is Jesus. Number three, let us not be deceived. We do not want to be deceived and worship the devil himself. Nor do we want to be deceived into worshiping an image of God that includes attributes of the devil. And this is the majority of the church today. 
Okay, so the church today, most of the church today, they believe in Jesus, yet they have a messed up image of Father. They think he's half evil, half good, or they think he used to do terrible things and now he's changed. And all those are wrong ideas. And they're wrong ideas because people have established their image of God not on Jesus alone as they should. Number four, there are consequences of deception. Most people believe that God is part good and part evil, yet they have been religiously trained to call evil good, so that evil attributes have been rebranded as good and holy and just. Therefore, most believers are greatly hindered in faith and in love for God, because who can truly love and trust a God who committed horrendous acts of genocide, killing of babies, great acts of terror, plagues, and other evil things? Amen? Number five, woes come upon people who call evil good. We don't want woes to come. People also fail to realize that they blaspheme God by the evil thoughts they have of him. The New Testament reveals that killing is evil, killing is an enemy of God, and the power of death, in fact, it belongs to the devil whom Jesus came to destroy. Yet they turn around and accuse God of committing great acts of murder, acts of genocide, of baby killing in the Old Testament. It is blasphemy to accuse God of doing the deeds of the devil. So let us learn the true nature of Father versus Devil, God versus Satan, to avoid deception, to avoid woes, to avoid blasphemy, to avoid hindered love, and to avoid hindered faith. Amen. Okay, so the Bible tells us in Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Okay, so woes means bad things will come upon those who call evil good, who put darkness for light, bitter for sweet. Okay, and so unfortunately most of the church is here. They read the Bible and they think that all the evil things that were done in the Old Testament, they rebrand them as righteous and holy deeds, when in fact they're not. The nature of a deed itself determines whether something is good or evil, not the recipient of the deed. It's evil to burn people alive if they're Christian. It's evil to burn people alive if they're Muslim. It's just evil to burn people alive. Okay, that's just one example. It's evil to rob from a good person. It's evil to rob from an, an evil person. Robbing is evil. So it's the deed itself that makes something evil. It's not the recipient of the deed. Amen? And so the devil has tricked people. He has gotten people to call evil good because he'll proclaim certain things to be righteous deeds which in fact are evil deeds but it's his excuse for doing the things that he wants to do steal kill and destroy and mark 3 28 to 30 verily i say to you that all the sins shall be forgiven to the sons of men and evil speakings blasphemies with which they might speak evil but whoever may speak evil in regard to the holy spirit has not forgiveness to the age but is in danger of age during judgment, because they said he has an unclean spirit. Okay, so Jesus warned us that when we speak evil of the Holy Spirit, then we are at risk of not having forgiveness through this age, through this lifetime. We are in danger of age enduring judgment. And that word judgment is the Greek word crisis. And that means separation from God, trial, condemnation. In other words, if you are blaspheming God, you have utterly separated yourself from him and you are extremely vulnerable to the devil and he will attack you. And that's what happens. Okay. And so we don't want to blaspheme our father. First of all, we want to have a true image of him. We want to see him in truth. We want to know him in truth. And we need to make sure that we're not thinking and speaking evil of him. We need to make sure that we're not thinking and speaking that he's the savage killer of the Old Testament. I mean, what do you think is happening when people run around and proclaim that Father God committed acts of genocide in the Old Testament? What are they doing? They're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so that's why you see so many Christians. They look no different than your average unbeliever in terms of the victory that they have in life. Well, why is that? It's because through their thoughts and the things they say, they have separated themselves from God. By holding evil images of Father, they separate themselves from Him. They may believe in Jesus, but they're not experiencing full salvation in this life because they think evil of God. Okay, so we need to correct that. 
Okay, let's just quickly look at the naming conventions of the devil. None of the following names are actually the true name of the devil. They are all descriptive terms rather than proper nouns, although they are commonly used as proper nouns. Remember that Satan presents himself as God, as an angel of light, as righteous and holy, with the intention of being worshipped. Therefore, he has various God names and God titles that he uses. He typically doesn't present himself with evil names. His identity would be revealed, and then who would worship him? So in Job 2.7, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Okay, so we're going to look at different names that we use for the devil in, on this page. So Satan is one of the names that we use for him. And there's um, the Old Testament word and then there's a New Testament word. So we'll look at both definitions. Okay, so Satan in the Old Testament is the word Satan. And it simply means adversary, one who withstands an adversary in general, superhuman adversary, Satan as a proper noun. Okay, so the word itself, it just means an adversary, someone who is against you. Okay, so in, in this particular passage, it's not Satan himself, it's a Satan. It is a an adversary. Okay, and we'll talk about that at a future time. But it is an adversary who went from the presence of the Lord and struck Job. There are many Satans. There are many adversaries. The devil has a kingdom, and in his kingdom there are layers of government. You know, there's principalities, powers, mights, and dominions. Okay, so there is a hierarchy within the devil's kingdom. And there are many Satans. There are many adversaries against humanity and against our Father. All right? So it simply means adversary. We go to Job 41.1. Another name of the devil, um, or perhaps of his beast, would be the, the name Leviathan. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook, or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? So we'll look at more of this chapter later on. Um, but Leviathan is a fire-breathing creature who is king over all the sons of pride. Okay, so he is a, he's described with physical attributes, yet he's also spiritual in nature. So Leviathan is a beast that was created by the devil. Okay, um, so Leviathan is one name that's associated with the devil. And the definition here, it's a wreathed animal, a serpent, uh, figuratively the constellation of the dragon. It's also a symbol of Babylon. If we look in the Brown Driver Briggs Dictionary, then we'll see that it's Leviathan, it's a sea monster, it's a dragon. Okay, so one of the names of Satan is Leviathan, is Satan, is dragon. Okay, another one would be how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer son of the morning. Okay, well, Lucifer, it's not really the name of the devil. None of these are the names of the devil. Okay, these are just descriptive terms that we commonly use as names for the devil. But Lucifer is this word, Halel. And Halel simply means light bearer, shining one, morning star, Lucifer of the king of Babylon and Satan. Okay, so this term, it actually describes um, how Satan looks. He's He's a shining one. He's beautiful. He's bearing of light. You know, so if we ever saw him live and in person, he would be beautiful and glorious, bearing light, shining. He's a glorious angel. You know, he wasn't made to look evil. Our father made him perfect, and then something happened within him, and he deviated and wanted to be worshipped. But he is a beautiful angel. Amen? Okay, so this term Lucifer is just descriptive of how he looks. Okay, if we go to Revelations 12, 9, we see four different terms. So the great dragon was cast out, a serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. All right, so here we see dragon, serpent, devil, and Satan. Dragon is the word dracon in Greek, and it simply means dragon or a great serpent. And then we see the word serpent is the Greek word ophis, and this is a snake or a serpent. And with the ancients, the serpent was an emblem of cunning and wisdom. Okay, so we know that Satan is tricky. You know, he's a deceiver. He's cunning. All right, so that's a descriptive term. Then the word devil is the Greek word diablos. And this means a traducer, um, Satan, a false accuser, devil, and slanderer. Okay, so that, again, these are some descriptive aspects of the devil. He's a, an accuser of the brethren. He is a slanderer, you know, so those are some terms that describe who he is and what he does. Then in Greek, we have the word satanus, and that's translated to Satan, and that would equate to Satan in the Old Testament. 
And this is an adversary, one who opposes another in purpose or act. Okay, so this is uh, another definition from the Strong's Dictionary would be the accuser. That is the devil, Satan. Okay, so you can see that every one of the terms on this page, they're not actually proper names. They're more descriptive terms. And what we're going to find is the devil doesn't typically go by these names. What he goes by are God names, and we venerate the God names. We, we think of the God names as good. You know, if he came across with an evil name or if he presented himself as, you know, I am the devil, your God, nobody would worship him. Nobody would obey him, and his purpose would fail. Okay, so he doesn't come like that. He mostly comes as God. Okay, on this page, Satan's number one objective is to be worshipped as God. Most people don't recognize the devil because they are looking for a dragon who is unjustly running around killing people and doing evil deeds. However, his normal self-presentation and appearance is as God and not as a blatantly evil being. His primary objective is to deceive you into thinking that he is God in particular by displaying supernatural power. Remember that Satan is the one who has the powers of sickness, curse, and death. He also has the power to bring down fire from heaven, among other powers. Be aware that any god who is doing great plagues, curses, acts of death and destruction, and fire from heaven is in fact the devil himself or an agent of his, such as his beast. Okay? So it's very important because he's going to tell you that he's God and then he deceives people. He'll add on top of his proclaiming to be God. He'll add on top of that displays of supernatural power. And that's where he, he locks people in. That's where he seals the deal. That's where he really gets you to believe because he'll do some supernatural act after proclaiming to be God. He'll do something like fire from heaven. And then you're like, oh my God, nobody but God could do that. And then, then you bow down and you worship him. Okay, that's what he does. Remember that Jesus showed us the works of the Father, healing, devil casting, dead raising, needs fulfilling, food multiplying. Jesus never demonstrated power to kill, to make sick, to bring harm, or to bring trials and curses upon people. Jesus refused to do signs that people were seeking. They wanted a sign from heaven, such as fire from heaven, but Jesus refused to do that. Jesus is the true image of God. Jesus showed us the power and the works of our Father. We need to test all things against Jesus. Okay, this is the most important thing in the world. Jesus is the benchmark. Jesus is the true image of God. When our image of God deviates from who Jesus revealed to us, then we're in error. Amen? When our image of Father differs from the character and nature that Jesus revealed, the deeds that Jesus revealed in the Gospels, then we are in error. Then we have a wrong image of God. Jesus is the perfect revealed image of Father upon this earth. Amen? We need to test everything against Jesus. We need to test the things in the Bible against Jesus in the Gospels. Everything must be tested against the character and nature and the deeds of Jesus. And the deeds of Jesus were the works of Father. If you do that, you will never go wrong. If you do that, you will always be in truth. You will always have an accurate image of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, his original downfall, the devil, was in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend by the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So his downfall was that he wanted to exalt himself above God, above the stars of God. He wanted to be like God. I will be like the Most High. So this pride came into him. He was jealous of the worship that Father was receiving. He wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to rule and reign. He wanted to be above all things. He wanted people to bow down to him. And it was that pride that was the downfall of the devil. That's when he fell. Okay. In Luke 4, 5 to 7. Then the devil, taking him, Jesus, up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory. 
for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Okay, so this is just amazing. So what is the devil trying to do? The devil, first of all, the devil has all authority in the earth, and he gives it to whomever he wishes. When Adam and Eve sinned, they gave all authority over the earth to the devil, and the devil became the god of this world. He became the ruler of this world. Okay, and now, uh, at this time, the devil would give authority and take authority. He'd give it to whomever he pleased, and he would take it from whom, whomever he pleased. And he was tempting Jesus to give Jesus authority in the earth if Jesus would worship him. See, with the devil, his number one objective is to be worshipped. He got Adam and Eve to bow down to him. He said way back in Isaiah that he wanted to be like the Mosai. In other words, he wanted to be worshipped. And now he's trying to get Jesus, the Son of God, to worship him. That's just mind-blowing. Okay, so you can see how prideful he is. You can see that his number one objective of all things is not to kill you and destroy you. That's his secondary objective. His number one objective is he wants you to worship him. He craves and needs worship. And he was tempting Jesus to give him authority in the earth if Jesus would worship him. Okay, so that's extremely revealing. It's revealing that you know God did not have authority in the earth. It's revealing that it reveals his primary objective as well. If we look at 2 Thessalonians, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among the, those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Okay, so here we see that um, the devil has agents that come. There's this man of sin, the son of perdition, and he, he exalts himself above everything that is called God. He exalts himself above everything that is worshipped. That means he exalts himself above Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and, and any other so-called God that there is. So he's exalting himself and saying that he's above all of that. And he presents himself as God himself. So he doesn't come telling you that he's the devil. He doesn't come with horns and fire, you know, looking evil. He comes as God. He's beautiful and he's glorious. And he's presenting himself as God. He's sitting in the temple as God. He's showing himself that he is God. And then he will convince you that he's God because he will demonstrate power, signs, and lying wonders. And he has the ability to bring unrighteous deception upon the people. So he's very, con he's very convincing. He's beautiful, so you don't recognize him as being a devil from how we're trained to think of him. He's beautiful. He's glorious. He's powerful. He has supernatural power, signs and wonders. And he's, you know, he's the father of lies. And so he has deceptions that we couldn't even imagine. And so he, he's the deceiver of all the world. That's what it tells us in Revelations. All right. So again, you can see the primary objective is to receive worship. He's exalting himself above everything that's worshiped so that he will receive the worship. Number one objective. All right, again, in Revelations chapter 13. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Okay, this is an extremely revealing passage. A beast has already come. Revelations is talking about another beast which is coming. So a first beast already came. Okay, and this... The beast, it's like a lamb in some regards, and it's like a dragon in some regards. Okay, so that means there's going to be an innocent-looking side to, to this creature, and then there's going to be an evil side. Okay, and so that's the same thing we've been saying, that you know, although he's a devil, he's going to come looking beautiful, saying, 
good things, speaking righteousness. Okay, so this second beast is coming. He's going to exercise all the same authority of the first beast. A first beast already came and he's in the Old Testament if you look for him. He's not hard to find. Okay, a first beast already came. You can find him in the Old Testament. And this this second beast, he's going to do the he's going to cause the earth and those who dwell on the earth to worship the first beast. Okay, so whatever the beast does, he's doing to draw worship to the beast. Okay, the beast is of the devil. Okay, so the devil is drawing worship to himself, to his creations, so-called. Okay, so he's drawing worship in his direction by getting you to worship the beast. All right. Well, this first beast and the second beast, they do um, particular signs. In particular, they cause fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So remember in Thessalonians, it says that um, this man of sin comes according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So this the beast, you know, agents of Satan, they're angels. They have power. They have supernatural power. And they can do signs. And the primary sign that we need to be aware of is causing fire to come down from heaven on the earth. Now, this first beast is in the Old Testament. And whenever you find somebody causing fire to come down from heaven, that's the beast. That was the first beast. Another beast is going to come and do the same thing. And by way of his proclamation that he is God, by way of his beauty, by way of the, the so-called righteous things that he speaks, he will deceive those who dwell on the earth and he will confirm everything he said by doing signs, which will cause your ordinary person to believe that truly this is God. Okay, so you can see on this page, it's all about worship. The devil wants to be worshipped. He wants his agents to be worshipped, you know, the beast, the man of sin. He wants to draw worship in his direction. And therefore, all these scriptures on this page reveal that to us. Satan is the God and ruler of this world. Satan lost his place in heaven due to his desire to be like the Most High. He wanted to be God and he wanted to be worshipped. He came down to this earth with great wrath, such as Revelations warns us, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Okay, so this is super important. Remember, we're not looking for a devilish looking devil. We're looking for a God. Satan is coming and presenting himself as God. And so one key attribute is he is a God of great wrath. When you, whenever you see a God of great wrath doing evil deeds, stealing, killing, and destroying, there you have found the devil. Okay? And you can find him in your Bible. He is a God of great wrath. Remember, Jesus revealed the true character and nature of our Father, and Jesus didn't kill anybody, didn't curse anybody, didn't make anybody sick, didn't bring a trial upon anybody. He only forgave. He never punished. That is the true image of God. Number two, literally, the devil became the ruler and God of this world upon the sin of Adam and Eve. Authority over mankind and the earth came into the hands of the devil as a result of sin. Satan was the legal ruler over this earth until Jesus redeemed us from sin and death and law and curse. Upon these acts of Jesus, those of us who believe are translated out of Satan's rulership and are translated into Christ. Okay, so when people are still in their sins, they're still under the authority of the devil. When our sins are washed away and when we're redeemed from law and curse, then Satan loses his authority over us. All right. In Revelations 12, 12, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. All right. So we see in this scripture that the devil, he has great wrath. Remember that he's presenting himself as God. So he's a God of great wrath. And we see from Jesus in John 12, 14 and 16, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Okay, so Jesus says that somebody else besides him was ruling the earth. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were not ruling the earth at the time Jesus came. That's very important. When Jesus arrived on earth, he had no authority in the earth. He only had authority in heaven. When he was resurrected, it says in Matthew 28, that he has received all authority in heaven and in earth. But he had no authority in the earth until after the resurrection. In John 14, it says, 
I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. Okay, so um, the ruler of the world, again, Jesus is referring to the devil as the ruler of this world. And Jesus said he has nothing in him, meaning there was no sin in Jesus. Therefore, the devil had zero authority over Jesus because Jesus had no sin. Whereas, on the contrary, all mankind has sinned. Apart from Jesus, all mankind has sinned. Therefore, the devil had authority over all mankind by way of sin. But when, when the devil has nothing in you, because your sins have been washed away, then he has no authority over you from that perspective. In John 16, And when he, Holy Spirit, has come, Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So again, we see Jesus is referring to someone besides Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as being the ruler of this world. And in fact, um, this person is evil and he is judged. It's, he's referring to the devil. Okay, so these three verses tell us that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were not ruling and reigning during Old Testament times, which is when Jesus came. It was still the Old Covenant. Um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were not in power, not in authority over the earth. We know from uh, Luke chapter 4, in fact, that the devil was in authority. Let's just read that one. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Okay, so this is a, a perfect proof point. Jesus has zero authority in the earth. And Jesus and Father are one. He's from the Father. He's of the Father. He's one with the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So everything the Father had, Jesus had. Everything Jesus has, the Father has. Okay, so they're all one. So, um, therefore, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit did not have any authority in the earth after the sin of Adam and Eve because Father had made the earth. He had given it to man. And he made man the rulers over all the earth. You can see that in Genesis chapter 1 and also in the Psalms. It talks about, you know, the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Okay, so when Adam and Eve sinned, they were, before they sinned, they were the gods of this world. After they sinned, the devil became the god of this world, meaning the ruler of this world, the authority of this world. And so that was the downfall of all the earth and of mankind. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4 but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this world has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Okay, so this word, um, sometimes, depending what Bible version you read, whose minds the God of this age or the God of this world has blinded. In King James, it says God of this world. In New King James, it says God of this age. But irrespective, notice that the Holy Spirit is referring um, to the devil through Paul. He's, he's saying, he's referring to the devil as the God of this world or the God of this age. So he's being called a God. He presents himself as God. Truly, according to Jesus, he is the ruler of this world. And, and so we need to be aware we're looking for a messed up God. We're not looking for somebody who says they're the devil. I mean, that's too easy to identify. We can identify that at any time and we can avoid that. But we're looking for a God with some problems about him. In Colossians 1, 13 to 14, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so this passage is telling us that before we are redeemed by way of Jesus, we are in the power of darkness. And literally, this is the word exousia in Greek. Exousia means authority. And so sometimes authority is called power. But, but until our sins are washed away, we are under the authority of darkness. That means that the devil is our ruler. The devil is our God. We are, under, we are in his domain and we are his subjects until... We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus when our sins are washed away. And when our sins are washed away, then we are translated out of the devil's kingdom and we're put into Christ, into the kingdom of the Son. Amen? Number 10. 
What's the conclusion here? If you want to see Satan, you need to quit looking for a devil and look for a messed up God. Satan was operating as the God of this world. He was the legal ruler. He had great wrath. You are looking for a God who was literally in authority and who had great wrath. There you have the devil. Do you see a God in the Bible that doesn't look like the loving father whom Jesus revealed to you? Jesus is the true image of God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How many people did Jesus kill, curse, make sick, punish, bring trials upon? Zero. Jesus revealed Father to you. Lay hold of this true image. Amen. Okay, on the next several pages, what I want to do is I want to look at the various powers of the God of this world. Okay, so it's super important. We're not looking for a devilish looking devil. We are looking for a devil who's presenting himself as God. And this God, this devil God, the God of this world has uh, many different powers. And we want to reveal those powers. That way, when you, that way you can easily identify the God of this world and see him distinctly from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The New Testament reveals the truth about Father God versus devil God and the powers that each have. We see in Acts, in Job, and in Luke that Satan is the one who has the power of sickness, and actually many more places than that. Notice that Jesus was healing those who were oppressed by the devil. In Acts 10.38, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. So Jesus specifically... Um, and, and in fact, we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all three in agreement. Okay, how God the Father anointed Jesus the Son with the Holy Spirit. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're all three in agreement. And what was happening? Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. And what was he doing? He was going about healing people who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Okay, so if somebody has a healing need, if they have sickness, pain, injury, spirit of infirmity, anything like that, then that means they are oppressed by the devil, period. Okay, interestingly, when you look in the Old Testament, you see that Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, claims responsibility for all sickness and all disease in Deuteronomy 28. In Deuteronomy 28, verses 58 to 61. If you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sicknesses. Moreover, he will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt of which you were afraid and they shall cling to you. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in this book of the law will the Lord bring upon you until you are destroyed. Okay, so this was the God in the Old Testament. So Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord your God, you know, depending which Bible version you read, you'll see various names. He claims responsibility for all sickness and all disease. Well, Jesus was healing those who were oppressed by the devil. So, we have, to, we have to reconcile who is the God of the curses in Deuteronomy 28 if Jesus was healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Amen? It wasn't Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were healing people who were oppressed by the devil. Okay? And if Yahweh claims responsibility for 100% of all sicknesses, then who is he who brings those curses? It's the devil. In Job 2.7, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Okay, so here we have a, a Satan, a, an adversary, who struck Job with sickness. So we can see that Satan himself and his workers, they have the ability, they have the power of sickness to bring sickness and plagues upon people. And Luke 13, 16. So ought not this woman, okay, this lady was the one who was hunched over for 18 years, so ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. 
Okay, so here, these are just two examples in these passages in Job and Luke where you can clearly see that the devil is responsible for sickness. But truly, all sickness, all disease, all injury, all of that is the working of the devil. Okay? And so that's all the, all sickness and injury. It's the power of the devil. It belongs to the devil. It doesn't belong to God. God's power is to heal us. Okay, number five. We also clearly see in Hebrews and 1 Peter and John and other places that Satan is the one who has the power of death versus Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who have the power of life. Okay, they, they don't have the same power. The devil has the power of death. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have the power of life. Jesus specifically came to this earth to destroy the devil who had the power of death. So all the killing, all, all killing, all death, all destruction, it's a working of Satan. It's never a working of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Hebrews 2.14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So we see that Jesus specifically came to this earth for the purpose of destroying him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Okay, so the power of death belongs to the devil. It does not belong to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They do not possess the power of death. They came to destroy the one who had the power of death. Okay, and the way he destroys it is by giving us resurrection life. Amen? So, all death is not of our Father, it's not of Jesus, it's not of the Holy Spirit. All killing is of the devil. All, all sickness is of the devil. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Okay, so the devil is the one who's seeking people to devour. Devour means to kill them, to destroy them. John 10, 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I, Jesus, have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Okay, so the thief is the devil and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So all the powers of stealing, killing, and destroying, they belong to the devil. And the power of life belongs to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so the when you find a God who's busy killing people, you found the devil. We also see that Jesus redeemed us from law and curse. Curses are afflictions of evil. Curses could be destructions, sicknesses, plagues, deaths, oppressions, captivities. There's a million different kinds of curses that you can find in the Old Testament, especially in Deuteronomy 28. Many of them are spelled out. And curses, by definition, they come from the evil one because they are acts of evil. They are afflictions of evil. We must realize that everything that Jesus redeemed us from he is not the author of it. Jesus specifically came to this earth to set us free from all oppression of the devil, such as curses. In Galatians 3.13, we see, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So Jesus specifically came to this earth to redeem us from the curse, redeem us from the law, and he did this by bearing the curse for us. And he did it by living perfectly under the law and bearing the punishment of the law for us, which is the curse. By way of doing those things, he was a qualified redeemer for those who believe in him. And so therefore he redeems us out from under the law and out from under the curses. It's the same thing as what he did with sin. Jesus lived perfectly sinless. He bore all the punishment for sin. And therefore, by faith in him, we can have our sins washed away and we can be freed from all the consequences of sin, such as death and other punishments. Amen. So Jesus came to redeem us from curse and law. All right. So anything that he's redeeming us from, he is not the author of it. Otherwise, it would be kingdom divided. He would be working against himself. He would be double minded. You know, if he was the one who, who brought curses upon us and then he saves us from himself, that would be double minded. It would be kingdom divided. And it's completely illogical. He came to this earth specifically for the stated purpose to set us free from oppression of the devil. Curses are oppression of the devil. Amen. So the power of curse belongs to the devil. So in conclusion, 
the God of this earth, the devil, has the powers of sickness, death, destruction, and curse. Jesus sets us free from all of these. By the way, who claimed responsibility for all the sicknesses in Deuteronomy 28? Who said that he rejoices in destroying lives? Okay, when you read Deuteronomy 28, you will see that Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, claims responsibility for every sickness, every disease, all the plagues. He even says that he will rejoice in destroying people's lives. Okay, what, what we've just revealed on this page is that the devil presents himself as God. He's a God who has the power of sickness, a God who has the power of death, a God who has the power of destruction, a God who has the power of curse. He's not coming telling you he's the devil. He's coming telling you that he's God, but yet he has these messed up qualities about him, which do not align with the character and nature of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, well, devil God has the power of stealing and killing. Jesus revealed to us that Satan, who is the thief, has the power of stealing, killing, and destroying. We see this lived out in the story of Job, where a Satan, an adversary, made arrangements for murderous rage to come against Job. His people were killed and his animals were stolen as a result of the bands of raiders that the adversary, the Satan, brought against him. The ruler and God of this world has the power to send out evil spirits who coordinate murders and thefts. So in John 10.10, again, it says, The thief, the devil, does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Now if we go back and read in Job, we see this, this stealing being played out. In Job 12-17, to And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, when the Sabians raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away, Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Okay, so we see very clearly here that it was the working of Satan which brought forth these evil people to do his biddings of stealing and killing. Amen? So the devil was able to coordinate stealing and killing. He sent out evil spirits who rallied people to do their work, to do the devil's work. Okay, so what we're looking for, we're looking for a God who brings forth stealing, killing, and destroying. Satan presents himself as God. When you find a God that brings forth stealing, you have found devil God. When you find a God who brings forth killing and destroying, you have found devil God. Okay, now think back in the Old Testament. Do you remember a story where an evil spirit came upon someone who then went out and murdered 30 people for losing a gambling debt? He went and murdered 30 people. He stole their clothes to pay off his gambling debt. You remember that? Okay, do not call evil good. Call evil what it is. Call evil, evil. Okay, that is evil. That is an evil spirit that came upon Samson who caused him to go out and murder 30 innocent people who had nothing to do with anything. Uh, he stole their clothes to pay off a gambling debt. Do not dare say that that was the Holy Spirit that came upon him to do stealing, killing, and destroying. Do not do that. That will be blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Okay, on this page, we see that the God of this world has the power to bring forth deadly weather and floods. And let me just say something real quick. So what I'm trying to show you is I am showing you passages where it blatantly says the devil did something or Satan did something or his beast did something so that you can see that all the attributes that I'm drawing out um, they are all attributes that have been associated in the Bible with the devil or with his workers. Okay, so that way you can see clearly that these are definitely evil attributes. And then what we're looking for is we're looking for a God who displays these same evil attributes that are uh, proclaimed by the Bible itself as being of the devil. Okay, that way we can get an, an accurate portrait of Satan in his God image. Number one, the God of this world has the power to bring deadly weather. 
in the book of Job, the Satan brought forth a tornado which collapsed the house upon Job's children, killing all ten of them. We see in the book of Revelation that the serpent spewed a flood of water out of his mouth, seeking to destroy the woman who brought forth the son. From these passages, it is clear that Satan, whom we know possesses the power of death, also has the power to bring deadly weather to carry out his will of killing and destroying. In Job chapter 1, verses 12 to 19, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So here we see clearly that um, it's... It's the working of Satan that brought this forth. There was a great wind. Okay, so that's probably a tornado. Okay, so a tornado. The devil caused a tornado to come forth. It collapsed the house on the children, and all ten of Job's children were killed. And they actually weren't children, but they were young people. In Revelation chapter 12, verses 15 to 16, So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So here we clearly see that the devil has the power to produce a flood. In fact, the devil was trying to bring forth death and destruction by way of a flood. And we see that um, it's referred to as the serpent, as dragon. We saw earlier in the lesson that there are many names um, that we associate with the devil. And again, remember that he doesn't typically go by devilish names, serpent and dragon. Normally he goes by God names. So what we see on this page is we're looking for a God. The God of this world presents himself as God. He has the power to bring forth deadly weather, such as tornadoes. He has the power to bring forth deadly weather, such as floods. And the power of death belongs to the devil. And remember that the devil as God of this world, has the objective to get you to rebrand evil as good. The devil wants you to call evil good. So he's going to present his workings as righteous and holy deeds. So do you remember a flood somewhere in the Bible that wiped out all of mankind and all the living creatures? Who has the power of death? Who do we clearly see on this page has the power to bring forth deadly weather? Who did the deed in the Old Testament? It was the devil who flooded the earth. Father has no desire to kill and destroy. Father does not have the power of death and destruction. The power of death and destruction belongs to the devil. And the devil, operating as the god of this world, brought forth the flood which wiped out mankind. We also see that the god of this world has the ability to send murderous spirits and powerful spirits that bring forth superhuman strength in people. Number one, the God of this world, the devil, is the father of lies, as he is a liar himself, and he has the ability to send lying spirits to do his work. Lies and lying spirits are the resources which the God of this world utilizes. Not only is he the father of lies, but Satan is a murderer and has the ability to send out murderous spirits, such as we saw in the book of Job with the raids of the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans. Okay, so we're looking for a God who lies. We're looking for a God who sends lying spirits. We're looking for a God who has murderous spirits whom he sends out to do his biddings. When we find a God that does those things, we have found the devil. John 8:44, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie... He speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. All right. So any lying is from the devil. Any lying spirit is from the devil. Lying period is from the devil. Our father has no ability to lie. Okay. If we look at Titus chapter one, verse two, it's talking about God. And it says in hope of eternal life, which God 
who cannot lie, promised before time began. God, who cannot lie. There is no ability to lie with our Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. He cannot lie. He has no desire to lie. He has no lying spirits to send out. It says clearly here, Jesus says, that when, you know, lying is from the devil's own resources. So if anyone ever sends, if any God, so-called God, ever sends out lying spirits, for example, that is of the resources of the devil. Only the devil can send lying spirits. Our Father cannot. Okay? So let's just think about a passage in the Old Testament in 1 Kings 22, 23. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit and the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. Okay, so it very clearly says in First Kings chapter 22, verse 23, that Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, sends out lying spirits. Okay, who, who has the resources of lying? According to Jesus, it's the devil. Number four, the God of this world also has the ability to put his evil spirits upon people and cause them to have superhuman strength to the point where they can break shackles, chains, and bindings of any kind. Power so strong that they cannot be tamed and that they have the ability to physically overpower, harm, or kill numbers of people all at once. Okay, so the, the God of this world has very powerful spirits he can put upon people. We see this in Mark chapter 5, um, speaking about legion. And when Jesus had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And again in Acts chapter 19, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Okay, so think about this. In both of these cases, we have demon possession. There was an evil spirit upon this person in the book of Acts. Okay, and that evil spirit gave him superhuman power so that he was able to overpower with ease seven people who came against him. He prevailed against seven people at one time. He wounded all seven of them, somehow stripped them naked and sent them out wounded. So one person who was demon possessed was able to overcome seven men with ease. Okay, in Legion, it's, it's even more profound than that, where um, he was possessed by an unclean spirit. In fact, it was actually many spirits he was possessed with. And it says that no one could bind him not even with chains, because he had superhuman strength. So Legion had superhuman strength by way of demon possession, such that he was able to break shackles in pieces and nobody could tame him. Okay, well, think about that. Okay, remember, do you remember a story in the Old Testament where multiple times an evil spirit rushed upon someone? Okay, in particular, it was Samson. Okay, an evil spirit rushed upon Samson it caused him to commit murder. It caused him to steal, to break bindings, to kill thousands of people. Okay, that's not that's not righteous and holy. That's evil. Do not call evil good. Period. Okay, Samson was not a good man. Samson was doing evil. Samson was stealing and killing, and destroying. Samson was messing around with prostitutes and other women. Samson was doing great acts of of death and destruction. Samson was evil. Samson was doing the, the workings of the devil. Samson was truly, he was demon possessed. And that's how he had this superhuman strength to break the bindings with which Samson was bound. Okay, we see clearly from, from Jesus in Mark chapter 5 and in Acts chapter 19, those are workings of evil spirits. That's superhuman strength. Okay, the power of death belongs to the devil. The power of stealing and destroying belongs to the devil. The works that Samson was doing was stealing, killing, and destroying, which are the works of the devil. Do not say those are the workings of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? 
we already talked about number eight. Okay, there was another incident, you may recall, um, where an evil spirit from the Lord came upon someone. In particular, this was Saul. And then Saul then tried to murder King David. Well, he wasn't king yet. But Saul tried, King Saul tried to murder David with a javelin. So it specifically says, let me read this. In 1 Samuel 19, 9, And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul, as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, and David played with his hand. Okay, and then after that, he threw the javelin at David and tried to kill him. Okay, it clearly says, 1 Samuel 19, verse 9, And the evil spirit from whom? From the Lord, from Yahweh, from Jehovah, was upon Saul. Okay, so remember, we're looking for a God who has some messed up qualities about him. When you find a God who sends out murderous spirits, you have found devil God. When you find a God who sends out um, superhuman strength evil spirits, like what Legion had, like what the, the seven sons of Sceva demon had, like what Samson had, you have found devil God. When you find a God who sends out lying spirits, you found the devil. So we're looking for a, a God who has messed up qualities. Amen? Okay, the God of this world has powers of lying and deception. Okay, we've already looked at this to a degree. We're going to look at some more angles of it. If you want to see the devil, then you need to quit looking for the character and nature of a demon who is blatantly evil. You need to realize that the devil will be disguised. He will be declaring that he is God himself. He will speak holiness and righteousness. And he will deceive with lies and displays of supernatural power. The supernatural signs that the devil and his agents do cause people to be led astray into worshiping him or his beast. Okay, this is super important. Okay, the devil is deceptive. He's not coming telling you that he's a devil. He's coming telling you that he's God. He's going to speak of holiness and righteousness. And then he's going to deceive you with displays of supernatural power so that you will believe everything that he was saying. And therefore you will worship him or you'll worship his beast. In Revelations 12, 9, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay, so he doesn't deceive some of the world. He deceives the whole world. And how does he do it? He doesn't deceive the world by telling you he's the devil. He deceives the world by telling you that he's God and by displaying power. That's how he deceives us. That's how people in the Old Testament were deceived. That's how people in future times will be deceived. That's how people in present times are deceived. They read things and they hear things and they believe that that was God because of the display of the power and because he said he was God and because it's in my Bible. In John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. He is a liar and the father of it. Mark 13, 21 to 22. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, he is there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Okay, so Jesus clearly says that it's the devil who is the father of all lies. Okay, deception is a form of lying. Okay, the devil, he has false Christ that he sends out, false prophets he sends out. And he says that they will show signs and wonders to deceive. Okay, so it's not that people are just going to believe all the words that he says, but they're going to, they're going to be inclined to believe the words. But then when they see the signs and wonders then that's going to seal the deal and they're going to truly believe in these false Christs and false prophets. Okay, so we need to be aware of a God who has signs and wonders, who is beautiful, who presents himself as God. We need to look at the full character of this being and see what, is there anything wrong with him? Is there anything out of alignment with Jesus as we see in the Gospels? And if there's anything wrong with him, if there's anything that disagrees with the character and nature of Father that's revealed by Jesus in the Gospels, then that is a false Christ or a false God. Amen. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 9-10, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish 
because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Okay, so again, we see clearly that Satan is going to send his agents. They will have power, like miraculous supernatural power. They will perform signs. They will have lying wonders, and they will have unrighteous deception. Okay, so it's going to be very easy to believe the devil and his agents because of this display of supernatural power. What we need to get over is not every display of supernatural power is of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's super important. In 2 Corinthians 11, 14 to 15, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Okay, so again, super important. The devil is not presenting himself as a devil. He's presenting himself as godly, as an angel of light, as God himself. And he and his ministers, they're going to speak of righteousness. They're going to speak against sin. They're going to speak of, of holiness. Okay, they, they don't present themselves as devils. They present themselves as ministers of righteousness, as angels of light, as God himself. So the major fallacy that we have is we're looking for an evil looking devil who presents himself as evil. That's not deception. Okay. Deception is presenting yourself as God, looking beautiful, looking godly and talking about holiness. Okay. That's going to catch your attention. Supernatural deeds are going to get you to believe in him. He's going to speak against sin. That's going to get you to believe in him. But then you have to look at the deeds he does. Jesus said that, you know, the, we need to look at the fruit. Check the fruit. The fruit are the deeds. Is this God who's speaking all these wonderful things and looks so beautiful? Is he stealing, killing, destroying? Is he sending out lying spirits? Is he bringing forth plagues and great acts of death and destruction? If he is, then that is devil God, the God of this world. That's not Father God. Father God will be doing the works that we saw Jesus doing. Healing, helping, setting free, dead raising, fulfilling the needs of people, forgiving, not punishing. In Revelations 13, he performs great signs. Okay, this is talking about the coming beast. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Okay, the key thing I want to draw out on this page is that the beast will deceive us by way of the signs that he does, supernatural signs such as fire coming down from heaven. Five or six occasions in the Old Testament, fire came down from heaven. That's a working of the beast. It's a great deception. It caused the people who were living back then to believe that that was God. Amen? And he's going to come again. A second beast is going to come and do the same thing. So the key message here, Satan presents himself as God. He speaks righteousness. He deceives us by telling us that his evil deeds are in fact righteous deeds. And he seals the deal with displays of supernatural power. Okay, you've been warned many times. Jesus has warned us. Um, the Holy Spirit through Paul has warned us. Again, Paul warned us in 2 Corinthians. We have warning in the book of Revelations. We need to be on the lookout for someone claiming to be God, claiming his evil deeds to be righteous deeds, who's also displaying supernatural power, in particular fire from heaven. Okay, on this page, let's look at this um, power to make fire come down from heaven. Let's look at this more closely. So number one, the devil does not come looking blatantly evil. He is indeed the ruler of this world and presents himself as God or a false Christ. He deceives us greatly by speaking of righteousness and by performing supernatural deeds to cause us to believe that he is truly God. Examine the works and character of all gods and all Christ's by testing them against the image of Father that Jesus revealed to us in the Gospels. Any God, even if in the Bible, that does not align with the image revealed by Jesus is a false God. That is super important. And you need to remember that Jesus did not accept everything that he read in the Old Testament. If you read Matthew chapter 5, Jesus was rightly dividing the word, and he would quote something, You have heard it said to those of old. And then he would say something that was said by Yahweh, and then he would reject it and correct it. Every time he did that, 
He was rejecting something evil that was said in the name Yahweh in the Old Testament, and then he would correct it. Okay, Jesus accepted some things from the Old Testament, but yet he rejected many things from the Old Testament. There are words of God in the Old Testament. There are words of the devil in the Old Testament. There are works of Father in the Old Testament. There are many works of the devil in the Old Testament. We have to rightly divide the word of God just like Jesus demonstrated. Number two, take note. One of Satan's beasts has already come and deceived millions by use of supernatural signs, fire from heaven, and great plagues. We see in Job that a Satan is responsible for the fire of God falling from heaven, which killed people and killed animals. We have confirmation in the book of Revelations that fire from heaven is a working of the beast to deceive people. We see Jesus rejecting as evil the calling down of fire from heaven like Elijah did. We see Leviathan, who is an agent of the devil. He is a fire-breathing beast. So fire from heaven is of the devil. Fire from heaven is of the devil. Now reread the Old Testament looking for fire from heaven and tell me what you find. Okay? Super important. A first beast already came. Now let's just read in Job. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So here we clearly see that fire from heaven in the book of Job, it's the working of Satan. If we go to Revelations 13, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the first beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Okay, we've talked about this a couple times already. Key points Okay, a first beast already came. The book of Revelations is talking about a second beast, another beast. And it specifically calls out that the beast um, exercised power to make fire come down from heaven. And that occurred during the Old Testament. So go back and reread the Old Testament and look for a God who brings down fire from heaven. And there you have devil God proclaiming to be God. For what reason? To cause worship to occur. Everything the devil's doing is to draw worship. In Luke chapter 9. But they, the village of Samaritans, did not receive Jesus, because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? But Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So here we see that Jesus was saying that, first of all, he rebuked them. That means he sharply reprimanded James and John for their desire to call down fire from heaven. And Jesus said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. And there's only two manner of spirit. There's a the manner of spirit of our Father, which is good and holy. And then there's the manner of spirit of the devil, which is evil, which steals, kills, and destroys. Okay, so any, any, um, any working to kill people, such as commanding fire to come down from heaven and burn people alive, that is blatantly evil. We know that um, Satan possesses the power of death. Jesus came to destroy the devil who has the power of death. Okay, so what Elijah did was evil. Elijah did a working of the beast when he called down fire from heaven and burned alive 102 people. And Jesus rebuked his disciples for wanting to be like that and wanting to do like that. He says it's a wrong manner of spirit to call down fire from heaven. So Jesus himself rejects fire from heaven and killing people. In Job 41, we see about Leviathan. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? His sneezings flash forth light and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lights. Sparks of fire shoot out. 
Smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals, and a flame goes out of his mouth. Strength dwells in his neck, and sorrow dances before him. He beholds every high thing. He is king over all the children of pride. Okay, so here we have Leviathan, and he's described as a beast, and he has uh, evil attributes, you know, burning light, sparks of fire, smoke. His breath kindles coals. He has a devouring flame that goes out of his mouth. He causes sorrow. Um, in his presence, there's great sorrow. He's king over all the children of pride. So you can see that this is a spiritual being who can bring forth physical manifestations. Okay, now if you will read in the Bible, you will find that there is a God who's described with the same attributes whom King David was praying to. So I encourage you to read Psalm 18 and tell me what you find there. Okay, the God of this world, he tempts people, he makes war, he accuses, and he requests oaths to be taken in his name. To identify the devil, look for a God who brings forth temptations. Perhaps he tempts you to give you glory or to give you riches or to give you great authority. Or perhaps devil God will tempt you to kill your own son. You know, or he may have a multitude of other temptations. Let us remember what the Holy Spirit says. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. That's James 1.13. So if we, if we declare that Father God brings temptations, such as tempting you to murder your own son, then we blaspheme him and we accuse him of doing the works of the devil. And Jesus warned us against blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Amen? Okay, so if you ever find a God who's bringing forth temptations, that is not Father God, that is devil God. Matthew chapter 4, Then Jesus was led... Uh, by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay, so then we know that Jesus went through a series of temptations. Um, and the reason Jesus was being tempted by the devil was because he had to be tempted in every way that mankind is tempted. Therefore, he would be a good high priest who can relate to the needs of the people, as it tells us in, in Hebrews. So Jesus was tempted in all points that we were tempted, but he was victorious in them all. And therefore, he can help us through those same temptations. But the key point here is that the tempter is the devil. Okay, in Luke chapter 4, verses 6 to 7, um, we'll look at some temptations the devil was bringing to Jesus. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Okay, so this was the devil in the preceding verse had showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth and their glory. And he was offering to give Jesus great authority, authority over all the earth. He was tempting him to give him uh, actually authority over the kingdoms of the earth and, uh, and all the glory of those kingdoms if Jesus would worship him. Okay, so the devil was, was tempting to give authority and glory. What did he want? He wanted worship. And then he would give those things. Number five, when you find a God who is full of wrath, who loves to fight and who loves to make war, then you have found the devil himself. He presents himself as God. He presents himself as righteous. He presents his deeds of warfare, of stealing and plundering, of killing and destroying as righteous deeds, causing you to call evil good. He proves he is God by performing supernatural signs like fire from heaven, great plagues, and other supernatural deeds. All right? So we're looking for a God who is full of wrath, who loves to fight, who loves to make war. And when we find that one, we have found the devil himself. John 18, 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. Okay, so we know that the devil is the god of this world, and Jesus is saying he's not from this world, and therefore his servants do not fight. Therefore, this is also saying that all fighting is not from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All fighting, it's a working of the devil. It's a working of the god of this world. So when you find a god who likes to fight and who likes warfare, you have found devil god. In Revelations chapter 12, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, 
Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Then Revelations 12:17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay, so what we see in this passage is the devil, he is the accuser. He accuses people of sin. He accuses and then he brings forth curses upon them. Um, he brings great woes upon the inhabitants of the earth. Uh, the devil has great wrath. The devil likes to make war. Okay, so when you find a God that has these qualities, remember, he's not presenting himself as a devil. He's presenting himself as God. So when you find a God who likes to make war, who is full of wrath, who brings woes upon the people of the earth, who accuses people of sin and brings punishments and woes and curses against them, then you have found devil God. All right, so let me, this will be a little re repetitious, but let's just read it anyway. If you want to identify the devil, look for a God who is constantly accusing people of sin and desiring to punish them with curses. Everything Jesus redeemed us from is, is from the God of this world, the devil. Jesus redeemed us from curse. Therefore, the God of curse is the devil himself. The God of curse was constantly accusing people, yet Jesus never accused. Jesus never punished. Jesus never cursed anyone. Jesus only, he warned people to get out of sin. He forgave them. He healed them. He helped them. Jesus set people free from curses. Jesus revealed the Father to us. Father is not wrathful. He's not an accuser. He's not a tempter. And he's certainly not a God of war. Amen. In John 5.45 do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. Okay, so notice Jesus is not the accuser. We know that the devil from Revelations, he is the accuser of the brethren. Jesus said very clearly, do not think that I shall accuse you. There is one who accuses you, that is Moses. So Jesus is not the one accusing us of sin. He's the one who forgives us of sin. He's the one who redeems us from sin. He's the one who redeems us from law. He's the one who redeems us from curse of the law. Number 12. We need to be aware that any God who is asking you to take oaths in his name is the evil one because Jesus said so. Why would devil God want you to swear in his name? Because if you don't honor the oath, you have legally given him authority to afflict you by way of your swearing. Therefore, we should never take oaths. Okay, so we never want to take oaths because... We're creating an opportunity, if we don't fulfill that oath, to bring an affliction upon ourselves. Because it would be sin not to fulfill an oath. In Matthew 5, 33 to 37, Again you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Okay, so Jesus was very clear that we should not take oaths. Taking an oath and swearing, it's the same thing. We should not take oaths. The taking of oaths is from the evil one. Because if we do not fulfill the obligation, it is sin, and then that will draw an affliction upon us. Amen? So do not take oaths. So if you find a God who's asking you to take oaths, that is the evil one. Go back and read the Old Testament and tell me, do you find a God in the Old Testament who's telling you to take oaths in his name? Okay, on this page, this will be our final page here. And this is the portrait of the God of this world. And a reminder that everything that I have noted here all these things were associated with devil names. Okay, so all these attributes are confirmed evil attributes. And now what we're looking for is we're 
trying to identify the devil. The devil presents himself as God. So we're looking for a God who has these evil attributes about him. When we find a God who has these various evil attributes, we have found the devil himself presenting himself as God. Okay, it's very important because most people today would not recognize the devil as the devil. If he came into their church, they would think he was God because he's going to be beautiful, glorious, and present himself as God. So we need to identify these other attributes about him. So here, let's take a look at this portrait. So the God of this world, he presents himself as God. Sometimes he presents himself as an angel of light. So he's going to look glorious. He's going to look wonderful. He's going to look holy. He's going to talk holy. He has false Christ, false apostles, false prophets, and they speak of righteousness and holiness. Um, the God of this world has been visibly seen, whereas Jesus said no one has ever seen God at any time. The God of this world, he is glorious and beautiful in appearance. If we look in Ezekiel 28, we can see that he's described with um, a beautiful appearance. We know that he's shining with light. He's adorned with precious jewels. So the devil is very beautiful. He looks wonderful. He looks godly. He speaks godly. Okay? So he's going to be coming saying that he's God. His personality. We're looking for a God who craves worship above everything else. Notice Jesus never made a big deal about worship. He mentioned it a few times, but he never made a big deal about worship. He never asked anybody to bow down and worship him. He casually mentioned worship a few times, but that was not his number one objective. Okay, but there, the devil God, he craves worship above all things, and he fell from heaven because of that. He's jealous of other people being worshipped. He's jealous of father being worshipped. He's just jealous of anybody being worshipped because he wants to be worshipped himself. So when you find a God who's jealous to be worshipped above all else, you found devil God. His personality, so devil God, he's filled with great wrath. He brings woes upon people. Devil God, he has enticing and deceptive speech. The Bible says that Satan is actually, he's full of wisdom. Okay, so the devil, he's not going to come, um, well, the devil, he's going to come and he's going to ha have wisdom. We will hearken to the wisdom. He deceives us by way of his wisdom. He speaks of righteousness and holiness. The devil knows and speaks the word of God. Okay, what are the top objectives and game plan of the God of this world? So number one is he wants to be worshipped as God. So he's going to always present himself as God to the people when he's seeking to deceive them and draw their worship. He rules and reigns as the God of this world. So he literally, uh, especially before Jesus, had authority in the earth, um, was a ruler of the earth, was the God of this earth. We're looking for a God who likes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we know that Jesus was never stealing, killing, and destroying. Neither does Father steal, kill, and destroy. So whenever you find a God who steals, kills, and destroys, you have found the devil presenting himself as God. And of course, he will rebrand these evil deeds of stealing, killing, and destroying as just and holy deeds, as righteous deeds, as just repayments. You know, so he'll rebrand evil so that you will call it good. He will lead people astray from true God. Um, the devil God gets you to call evil good by rebranding it as righteous and holy. Devil God will imprint you. He will mark you with an evil image of God, an image of God who steals, kills, destroys, an image of God who's wrathful, who brings, brings great plagues, death, and destruction. Okay, so devil God seeks to mark you with an evil image of God. And if he gets you to think, if he gets you to adopt this evil image of God, then he has marked you. you he has basically drawn your worship to himself when you come to believe in a God who steals, kills, destroys, and is full of wrath, you're worshiping the devil himself, no matter what name you're using for it. He will seek to get you to blaspheme the Holy Spirit by getting you to uh, claim that Father or Holy Spirit is responsible for evil deeds. The God of this world will get you to take oaths in his name. He will seek to use your words against you. The God of this world, he's the one who's constantly accusing people of sin and then afflicts them with curses and, and great wrath and woes. Remember, Jesus, 
Jesus was never accusing anyone of sin. He warned them to get out of sin because he, he didn't want bad things to happen to them. He didn't want curses and sickness and death to happen to people. So he was warning them to get out of sin, but he was never accusing them of sin. Uh, we know that the Holy Spirit, there's only one sin that Holy Spirit accuses people of, which is not believing in Jesus. Okay, so he's he, his primary interest, the Holy Spirit is is telling people, you're, you don't believe in Jesus. You need to turn around and believe in Jesus. Okay, so we saw that back in the book of John. Okay, the God of this world, he has power of death and destruction. When you find a God who has the power of death, you have found devil God. When you find a God who has the power to bring forth sickness and plagues, you have found the devil presenting himself as God. When you find a God who brings forth curses upon people and upon the earth, you have found the, the God of this world. When you find a God who has the power to bring forth evil weather, such as floods and tornadoes, you have found devil God. You're looking for a God who commissions people to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay, that's the devil God. When you see a God who um, has the power to bring forth fighting and warfare, you know, a God of war, that is the devil. And we're also looking for a God who has supernatural destructive powers. When you find a God who brings fire from heaven, you have found um, the God of this world or his beast. The God of this world has a consuming fire that comes from his mouth. He has coals of fire, smoke, sparks of fire, lightnings. So when you see a God who's doing these things, you have found the God of this world. Hey, the God of this world, devil God. He has the power to bring forth temptations. He may tempt you with authority and glory in the earth. He may tempt you with trials, uh, temptations to sin and trials and tribulations to test the heart and to test loyalty. He may tempt you to sin and then afflict you with curses. The God of this world has the power to deceive. He has the power to send out lying spirits, evil spirits. He has the power to blind the minds of people, blind them from the truth. He has the power to deceive by way of displays of supernatural power, signs and lying wonders, fire from heaven. Okay, the God of this world, he has the power to send evil agents and spirits. He has the man of sin and the beast are a couple of his agents. He sends out lying spirits to do his biddings. He sends out murderous spirits. He has the ability to send out spirits that have supernatural strength uh, when they come upon people. Okay, so when you find a God that's demonstrating these attributes, you have found the devil who is masquerading as God himself, who's speaking righteousness and holiness, yet he's doing these evil deeds, which he causes people to rebrand as just and holy deeds. Okay, so now, do you recognize this person? Reread the Bible, reread the Old Testament, and tell me, do you see this person in the Bible? So in conclusion, do not be deceived. Do not call evil good. Do not take on an image of Father that does evil. Take on an image of God that is aligned to the deeds of Jesus, healing, dead raising, devil casting, fulfilling the needs of the people, loving people. Okay, so Jesus revealed a good image of Father to us. Jesus is the perfect revealed image of God. Do not be afraid to reject evil deeds of God or Lord or Jehovah, or Yahweh, as being of the devil. Jesus did this. He did it constantly in the Gospels, if you'll pay attention. He did it explicitly in Matthew chapter 5, when he would say that you have heard it said, but I say. Okay, every time he did that, he was rejecting something said by the God of the Old Testament, and then he was speaking truth to replace that. Okay, do be afraid to say that Father steals, kills, or destroys or does or commissions evil of any kind because that would be blasphemy and we do not want to blaspheme our father what we want to do is we want to see our father exactly the way jesus was in the gospels a good god good in every way life giving healing blessing doing good even to evil people amen so our objective here is not to be deceived, not to call evil good, but lay hold of an image of God that looks like Jesus in the Gospels. Then we will be victorious. Then we will love our Father. Then we will have an accurate image of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then we will walk in personal victory. Then we will be effective in ministering to the needs of the people because we will be able to trust God because we will see Him as good. Amen. So God bless you, and we'll talk soon.